Section 15 of the Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Erickson, Toronto. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg. Section 15. Chester's, July 27, 1712. My hopes and prospects are a wreck. My precious journal is lost, consigned to the flames. My enemy hath found me out, and there is no hope of peace or rest for me on this side the grave. In the beginning of last week, my fellow lodger came home, running in a great panic, and told me a story of the devil having appeared twice in the printing house, assisting the workmen at the printing of my book, and that some of them had been frightened out of their wits. That the story was told to Mr. Watson, who till that time had never paid any attention to the treatise, but who out of curiosity began and read a part of it, and thereupon flew into a great rage, called my work a medley of lies and blasphemy, and ordered the whole to be consigned to the flames, blaming his foreman and all concerned with the press, for letting a work go so far that was enough to bring down the vengeance of heaven on the concern. If ever I shed tears through perfect bitterness of spirit, it was at that time. But I hope it was more for the ignorance and folly of my countrymen than the overthrow of my own hopes. But my attention was suddenly aroused to other matters by Linton mentioning that it was said by some in the office the devil had inquired for me. Surely you are not such a fool, said I, as to believe that the devil really was in the printing office? Oh, God bless you, sir, saw him myself, gave him a nod and good day, rather a gentlemanly personage, green Circassian hunting coat and turban, like a foreigner, has the power of vanishing in one moment, though, rather a suspicious circumstance, that, otherwise his appearance not much against him. If the former intelligence thrilled me with grief, this did so with terror. I perceived who the personage was that had visited the printing house in order to further the progress of my work, and at the approach of every person to our lodgings, I from that instant trembled every bone, lest it should be my elevated and dreaded friend. I could not say I had ever received an office at his hand that was not friendly, yet these offices had been of a strange tendency and the horror with which I now regarded him was unaccountable to myself. It was beyond description, conception, or the soul of man to bear. I took my printed sheets, the only copy of my unfinished work existing, and on pretense of going straight to Mr. Watson's office, decamped from my lodgings at Portsburg a little before the fall of evening, and took the road towards England." As soon as I got clear of the city, I ran with a philosophy I knew not before I had been capable of. I flew out the way towards Dalkeith so swiftly that I often lost sight of the ground, and I said to myself, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove, that I might fly to the farthest corners of the earth, to hide me from those against whom I have no power to stand. I travelled all that night and the next morning, exerting myself beyond my power, and about noon the following day I went into a yeoman's house, the name of which was Ellenshaw's, and requested of the people a couch of any sort to lie down on, for I was ill and could not proceed on my journey. They showed me to a stable loft where there were two beds, on one of which I laid me down, and falling into a sound sleep I did not awake till the evening. That other three men came from the fields to sleep in the same place, one of whom lay down beside me, at which I was exceedingly glad. They fell all sound asleep, and I was terribly alarmed at a conversation I overheard somewhere outside the stable. I could not make out a sentence, but trembled to think I knew one of the voices, at least, and rather than not be mistaken, I would that any man had run me through with a sword. I fell into a cold sweat, and once thought of instantly putting hand to my own life, as my only means of relief. May the rash and sinful thought be in mercy forgiven. When I heard, as it were, two persons at the door, contending, as I thought, about their right and interest in me. 
That the one was forcibly preventing the admission of the other, I could hear distinctly, and their language was mixed with something dreadful and mysterious. In an agony of terror, I awakened my snoring companion with great difficulty, and asked him in a low whisper who these were at the door. The man lay silent and listening till fairly awake, and then asked if I heard anything. I said I had heard strange voices contending at the door. "'Then I can tell you, lad, it has been something neither good nor canny,' said he. "'It's no for nothing that our horses are snorking that gate.' For the first time I remarked that the animals were snorting and rearing as if they wished to break through the house. The man called to them by their names and ordered them to be quiet, but they raged still the more furiously. He then roused his drowsy companions, who were alike alarmed at the panic of the horses, all of them declaring that they had never seen either Mouse or Jolly start in their lives before. My bedfellow and another then ventured down the ladder, and I heard one of them then saying, "'Lord be with us! What can be i' the house? The sweat's running off the poor beasts like water!' They agreed to sally out together, and if possible to reach the kitchen and bring a light. I was glad at this, but not so much so when I heard the one man saying to the other, in a whisper, "'I wish that stranger man may be canny enough.' "'God can,' said the other. "'It does nay look on cold wheel.' The lad in the other bed, hearing this, set up his head in manifest affright as the other two departed for the kitchen, and I believed he would have been glad to have been in their company. This lad was next the ladder, at which I was extremely glad, for had he not been there, the world should not have induced me to wait the return of these two men. They were not well gone before I heard another distinctly enter the stable and come towards the ladder. The lad who was sitting up in his bed, intent on the watch, called out, "'Was that there? Walker, is that you? Bertie, I say, is it you?' The darkling intruder paused for a few moments and then came towards the foot of the ladder. The horses broke loose and, snorting and neighing for terror, raged through the house. In all my life I never heard so frightful a commotion. The being that occasioned it all now began to mount the ladder towards our loft, on which the lad in the bed next to the ladder sprung from his couch, crying out, "'The L-A-A preserve us! What can it be?' With that he sped across the loft and by my bed, praying lustily all the way, and throwing himself from the other end of the loft into a manger. He darted, naked as he was, through among the furious horses, and making the door that stood open, in a moment he vanished and left me in the lurch. Powerless with terror and calling out fearfully, I tried to follow his example, but not knowing the situation of the places with regard to one another, I missed the manger and fell on the pavement in one of the stalls. I was both stunned and lamed on the knee, but terror prevailing, I got up and tried to escape. It was out of my power, for there were divisions and cross-divisions in the house, and mad horses smashing everything before them, so that I knew not so much as on what side of the house the door was. Two or three times was I knocked down by the animals, but all the while I never stinted, crying out with all my power. At length I was seized by the throat and hair of the head, and dragged away I wist not whither. My voice was now laid, and all my powers, both mental and bodily, totally overcome, and I remember no more till I found myself lying naked on the kitchen table of the farmhouse, and something like a horse's rug thrown over me. The only hint that I got from the people of the house on coming to myself was that my absence would be good company, and that they had got me in a woeful state, one which they did not choose to describe or hear described. As soon as daylight appeared, I was packed about my business with the hisses and execrations of the yeoman's family, who viewed me as a being to be shunned, ascribing to me the visitations of that unholy night. Again was I on my way southwards, as lonely, hopeless, and degraded a being as was to be found on life's weary round. As I limped out the way, I wept, thinking of what I might have been, and what I had really become, of my high and flourishing hopes when I set out as the avenger of God on the sinful children of men, 
of all that I had dared for the exaltation and progress of the truth, and it was with great difficulty that my faith remained unshaken. Yet was I preserved from that sin, and comforted myself with the certainty that the believer's progress through life is one of warfare and suffering. My case was indeed a pitiable one. I was lame, hungry, fatigued, and my resources on the very eve of being exhausted. Yet these were but secondary miseries, and hardly worthy of a thought compared with those I suffered inwardly. I not only looked around me with terror at every one that approached, but I was become a terror to myself, or rather my body and soul were become terrors to each other, and had it been possible, I felt as if they would have gone to war. I dared not look at my face in a glass, for I shuddered at my own image and likeness. I dreaded the dawning and trembled at the approach of night, nor was there one thing in nature that afforded me the least delight. In this deplorable state of body and mind was I jogging on towards the Tweed, by the side of the small river called Ellen, when just at the narrowest part of the glen, whom should I meet full in the face but the very being and all the universe of God would the most gladly have shunned. I had no power to fly from him, neither durst I, for the spirit within me, accuse him of falsehood and renounce his fellowship. I stood before him like a condemned criminal, staring him in the face, ready to be winded, twisted, and tormented as he pleased. He regarded me with a sad and solemn look. How changed was now that majestic countenance to one of haggard despair, changed in all save the extraordinary likeness to my late brother, a resemblance which misfortune and despair tended only to heighten. There were no kind greetings passed between us at meeting, like those which pass between the men of the world. He looked on me with eyes that froze the currents of my blood, but spoke not till I assumed as much courage as to articulate, "'You here, I hope you have brought me tidings of comfort?' "'Tidings of despair,' said he, "'but such tidings as the timid and the ungrateful deserve "'and have reason to expect. "'You are an outlaw and a vagabond in your country, "'and a high reward is offered for your apprehension. "'The enraged populace have burnt your house "'and all that is within it, "'and the farmers on the land bless themselves at being rid of you. "'So fare it with everyone who puts his hand "'to the great work of man's restoration to freedom "'and draweth back.' condemning the light that is within him. Your enormities cause me to leave you to yourself for a season, and you see what the issue has been. You have given some evil ones power over you, who long to devour you, both soul and body, and had has required all my power and influence to save you. Had it not been for my hand, you had been torn in pieces last night, but for once I prevailed." We must leave this land forthwith, for here there is neither peace, safety, nor comfort for us. Do you now and here pledge yourself to one who has so often saved your life and has put his own at stake to do so? Do you pledge yourself that you will henceforth be guided by my counsel and follow me whithersoever I choose to lead? I have always been swayed by your counsel, said I, and for your sake, principally, am I sorry that all our measures have proved abortive. But I hope still to be useful in my native isle. Therefore, let me plead that your highness will abandon a poor despised and outcast wretch to his fate, and betake you to your realms, where your presence cannot but be greatly wanted. Would that I could do so, said he woefully. But to talk of that is to talk of an impossibility. I am wedded to you so closely that I feel as if I were the same person. Our essences are one, our bodies and spirits being united, so that I am drawn towards you as by magnetism, and wherever you are, there must my presence be with you. Perceiving how this assurance affected me, he began to chide me most bitterly for my ingratitude, and then he assumed such looks that it was impossible for me longer to bear them. Therefore I staggered out of the way, begging and beseeching of him to give me up to my fate, 
and hardly knowing what I said, for it struck me that with all his assumed appearance of misery and wretchedness, there were traits of exultation in his hideous countenance, manifesting a secret and inward joy at my utter despair. It was long before I durst look over my shoulder, but when I did so, I perceived this ruined and debased potentate coming slowly on the same path, and I prayed that the Lord would hide me in the bowels of the earth or depths of the sea. When I crossed the Tweed, I perceived him still a little behind me, and my despair being then at its height, I cursed the time I first met with such a tormentor, though on a little recollection it occurred that it was at that blessed time when I was solemnly dedicated to the Lord and assured of my final election and confirmation by an eternal decree never to be annulled. This being my sole and only comfort, I recalled my curse upon the time and repented me of my rashness. After crossing the Tweed, I saw no more of my persecutor that day and had hopes that he had left me for a season. But alas, what hope was there of my relief after the declaration I had so lately heard? I took up my lodgings that night in a small, miserable inn in the village of Ancrum, of which the people seemed alike poor and ignorant. Before going to bed, I asked if it was customary with them to have family worship of evenings. The man answered that they were so hard set with the world that they often could not get time, but if I would be so kind as to officiate, they would be much obliged to me. I accepted the invitation, being afraid to go to rest, lest the commotions of the foregoing night might be renewed, and continued the worship as long as in decency I could. The poor people thanked me, hoped my prayers would be heard both on their account and my own, seemed much taken with my abilities, and wondered how a man of my powerful eloquence chanced to be wandering about in a condition so forlorn. I said I was a poor student of theology on my way to Oxford. They stared at one another with expressions of wonder, disappointment, and fear. I afterwards came to learn that the term theology was by then quite misunderstood, and that they had some crude conceptions that nothing was taught at Oxford but the black arts, which ridiculous idea prevailed over all the south of Scotland. For the present I could not understand what the people meant, and less so when the man asked me with deep concern if I was serious in my intentions of going to Oxford. He hoped not, and that I would be better guided. I said my education wanted finishing, but he remarked that the Oxford arts were a bad finish for a religious man's education. Finally, I requested him to sleep with me, or in my room all the night, as I wanted some serious and religious conversation with him, and likewise to convince him that the study of the fine arts, though not absolutely necessary, were not incompatible with the character of a Christian divine. He shook his head and wondered how I could call them fine arts, hoped I did not mean to convince him by any ocular demonstration, and at length reluctantly consented to sleep with me and let the lass and wife sleep together for one night. I believe he would have declined it had it not been some hints from his wife, stating that it was a good arrangement, by which I understood there were only two beds in the house, and that when I was preferred to the lass's bed, she had one to shift for. The landlord and I accordingly retired to our homely bed, and conversed for some time about indifferent matters, till he fell sound asleep. Not so with me. I had that within which would not suffer me to close my eyes, and about the dead of night I heard again the same noises and contention begin outside the house as I had heard the night before, and again I heard it was about a sovereign and peculiar right in me. At one time the noise was on the top of the house, straight above our bed, as if the one party were breaking through the roof, and the other forcibly preventing it. At another it was at the door, and at a third time at the window, but still mine host lay sound by my side and did not waken. I was seized with terrors indefinable and prayed fervently, but did not attempt rousing my sleeping companion until I saw if no better could be done. The women, however, were alarmed, 
and rushing into our apartment exclaimed that all the devils in hell were besieging the house then indeed the landlord awoke and it was time for him for the tumult had increased to such a degree that it shook the house to its foundations being louder and more furious than i could have conceived the heat of battle to be when the volleys of artillery are mixed with groans shouts and blasphemous cursing it thundered and lightened and there were screams groans laughter and execrations all intermingled i lay trembling and bathed in a cold perspiration but was soon obliged to bestir myself the inmates attacking me one after the other oh tam douglas tam douglas haste ye and rise out fray out that incarnal devil cried the wife ye are in iant the old ain in self for our last tibby saw his cloven cloots last night lord forbid roared tam douglas and darted over the bed like a flying fish then hearing the unearthly tumult with which he was surrounded he turned to the side of the bed and addressed me thus with long and fearful intervals if ye be the dale rise up and depart in peace out of this house afore the bedstry take kindling about ye and then it'll maybe be the war for ye get up and gang away out among your cronies like a good lad there's naebody here wishes you any ill ye hear me friend said i no christian would turn out a fellow creature on such a night as this and in the midst of such a commotion of the villagers nah if ye be a mortal man said he which i rather think from the use you made of the holy book nay na your practical jokes on strangers and honest folks these are some of your oxford tricks and i'll thank ye to be ower with them gracious heaven they are brickin through the house and the four corners at the same time the last tibby seeing the innkeeper was not going to prevail with me to rise flew towards the bed in desperation and seizing me by the waist soon landed me on the floor saying be ye dale be ye child ye's no lie there till baith the house and us be swallowed up her master and mistress applauding the deed i was obliged to attempt dressing myself a task to which my powers were quite inadequate in the state i was in but i was readily assisted by every one of the three and as soon as they got my clothes thrust on in a loose way they shut their eyes lest they should see what might drive them distracted and thrust me out to the street cursing me and calling on the fiends to take their prey and be gone the scene that ensued is neither to be described nor believed if it were i was momently surrounded by a number of hideous fiends who gnashed on me with their teeth and clenched their crimson paws in my face and at the same instant i was seized by the collar of my coat behind by my dreaded and devoted friend who pushed me on and with his gilded rapier waving and brandishing around me defending me against all their united attacks horrible as my assailants were in appearance and they all had monstrous shapes i felt that i would rather have fallen into their hands than be thus led away captive by my defender at his will and pleasure without having the right or power to say my life or any part of my will was my own i could not even thank him for his potent guardianship but hung down my head and moved on i knew not whither like a criminal led to execution and still the infernal combat continued till about the dawning at which time i looked up and all the fiends were expelled but one who kept at a distance and still my persecutor and defender pushed me by the neck before him at length he desired me to sit down and take some rest with which i complied for i had great need of it and wanted the power to withstand what he desired there for a whole morning did he detain me tormenting me with reflections on the past and pointing out the horrors of the future until a thousand times i wished myself non-existent i have attached myself to your wayward fortune said he and it has been my ruin as well as thine ungrateful as you are i cannot give you up to be devoured but this is a life that is impossible to brook longer since our hopes are blasted in this world and all our schemes of grandeur overthrown and since our everlasting destiny is settled by a decree which no act of ours can invalidate 
Let us fall by our own hands, or by the hands of each other, die like heroes, and throwing off this frame of dross and corruption, mingle with the pure ethereal essence of existence from which we derived our being. I shuddered at a view of the dreadful alternative, yet was obliged to confess that in my present circumstances, existence was not to be borne. It was in vain that I reasoned on the sinfulness of the deed and on its damning nature. He made me condemn myself out of my own mouth by allowing the absolute nature of justifying grace and the impossibility of the elect ever falling from the faith or the glorious end to which they were called. And then he said, this granted, self-destruction was the act of a hero, and none but a coward would shrink from it to suffer a hundred times more every day and night that passed over his head. I said I was still contented to be that coward, and all that I begged of him was to leave me to my fortune for a season, and to the just judgment of my creator, but he said his word and honor were engaged on my behalf, and these in such a case were not to be violated. If you will not pity yourself, have pity on me, added he. Turn your eyes on me, and behold to what I am reduced. Involuntarily did I return at the request, and caught a half glance of his features. May no eye destined to reflect the beauties of the new Jerusalem inward upon the beatific soul behold such a sight as mine then beheld. My immortal spirit, blood and bones were all withered at the blasting sight, and I arose and withdrew with groanings which the pangs of death shall never wring from me. Not daring to look behind me, I crept on my way, and that night reached this hamlet on the Scottish border, and being grown reckless of danger and hardened to scenes of horror, I took up my lodging with a poor hind who was a widower, and who could only accommodate me with a bed of rushes at his fireside. At midnight I heard some strange sounds, too much resembling those to which I had of late been inured, but they kept at a distance, and I was soon persuaded that there was a power protected that house, superior to those that contended for or had the mastery over me. Overjoyed at finding such an asylum, I remained in the humble cot, this is the third day I have lived under the roof, freed of my hellish assailants, spending my time in prayer and writing out this my journal, which I have fashioned to stick in with my printed work, and to which I intend to add portions while I remain in this pilgrimage state, which, I find too well, cannot be long. End of section 15section 15 of the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ann erickson toronto the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner by james hogg section 15 chesters july 27 1712 my hopes and prospects are a wreck. My precious journal is lost, consigned to the flames. My enemy hath found me out, and there is no hope of peace or rest for me on this side the grave. In the beginning of last week, my fellow lodger came home, running in a great panic, and told me a story of the devil having appeared twice in the printing house, assisting the workmen at the printing of my book, and that some of them had been frightened out of their wits. That the story was told to Mr. Watson, who till that time had never paid any attention to the treatise, but who out of curiosity began and read a part of it, and thereupon flew into a great rage, called my work a medley of lies and blasphemy, and ordered the whole to be consigned to the flames, blaming his foreman and all concerned with the press, for letting a work go so far that was enough to bring down the vengeance of heaven on the concern. If ever I shed tears through perfect bitterness of spirit, it was at that time. But I hope it was more for the ignorance and folly of my countrymen than the overthrow of my own hopes. 
but my attention was suddenly aroused to other matters by Linton mentioning that it was said by some in the office the devil had inquired for me. Surely you are not such a fool, said I, as to believe that the devil really was in the printing office? Oh, God bless you, sir, saw him myself, gave him a nod and good day, rather a gentlemanly personage, green Circassian hunting coat and turban, like a foreigner, has the power of vanishing in one moment, though, rather a suspicious circumstance, that, otherwise his appearance not much against him. If the former intelligence thrilled me with grief, this did so with terror. I perceived who the personage was that had visited the printing house in order to further the progress of my work, and at the approach of every person to our lodgings, I from that instant trembled every bone, lest it should be my elevated and dreaded friend. I could not say I had ever received an office at his hand that was not friendly, yet these offices had been of a strange tendency and the horror with which I now regarded him was unaccountable to myself. It was beyond description, conception, or the soul of man to bear. I took my printed sheets, the only copy of my unfinished work existing, and on pretense of going straight to Mr. Watson's office, decamped from my lodgings at Portsburg a little before the fall of evening, and took the road towards England. As soon as I got clear of the city, I ran with a velocity I knew not before I had been capable of. I flew out the way towards Dalkeith so swiftly that I often lost sight of the ground, and I said to myself, Oh, that I had the wings of a dove that I might fly to the farthest corners of the earth, to hide me from those against whom I have no power to stand. I travelled all that night and the next morning, exerting myself beyond my power, and about noon the following day I went into a yeoman's house, the name of which was Ellenshaw's, and requested of the people a couch of any sort to lie down on, for I was ill and could not proceed on my journey. They showed me to a stable loft where there were two beds, on one of which I laid me down, and falling into a sound sleep I did not awake till the evening. That other three men came from the fields to sleep in the same place, one of whom lay down beside me, at which I was exceedingly glad. They fell all sound asleep, and I was terribly alarmed at a conversation I overheard somewhere outside the stable. I could not make out a sentence, but trembled to think I knew one of the voices, at least, and rather than not be mistaken, I would that any man had run me through with a sword. I fell into a cold sweat, and once thought of instantly putting hand to my own life, as my only means of relief, may the rash and sinful thought be in mercy forgiven, when I heard, as it were, two persons at the door contending, as I thought, about their right and interest in me, that the one was forcibly preventing the admission of the other, I could hear distinctly, and their language was mixed with something dreadful and mysterious. In an agony of terror, I awakened my snoring companion with great difficulty, and asked him in a low whisper who these were at the door. The man lay silent and listening till fairly awake, and then asked if I heard anything. I said I had heard strange voices contending at the door. Then I can tell you, lad, it has been something neither good nor canny, said he. It's no for nothing that our horses are snorking that gate. For the first time I remarked that the animals were snorting and rearing as if they wished to break through the house. The man called to them by their names and ordered them to be quiet, but they raged still the more furiously. He then roused his drowsy companions, who were alike alarmed at the panic of the horses, all of them declaring that they had never seen either Mouse or Jolly start in their lives before. My bedfellow and another then ventured down the ladder, and I heard one of them then saying, "'Lord be with us! What can be i' the house?' The sweat's running off the poor beasts like water. They agreed to sally out together, and if possible to reach the kitchen and bring a light. I was glad at this, but not so much so when I heard the one man saying to the other, in a whisper, I wish that stranger man may be canny enough. God can, said the other, it does na look on co-weal. 
The lad in the other bed, hearing this, set up his head in manifest affright as the other two departed for the kitchen, and I believed he would have been glad to have been in their company. This lad was next the ladder, at which I was extremely glad, for had he not been there, the world should not have induced me to wait the return of these two men. They were not well gone before I heard another distinctly enter the stable and come towards the ladder. The lad who was sitting up in his bed, intent on the watch, called out, "'What's that there? Walker, is that you? Bertie, I say, is it you?' The darkling intruder paused for a few moments and then came towards the foot of the ladder. The horses broke loose and, snorting and neighing for terror, raged through the house. In all my life I never heard so frightful a commotion. The being that occasioned it all now began to mount the ladder towards our loft on which the lad in the bed next to the ladder sprung from his couch, crying out, The L-A-A preserve us! What can it be? With that he sped across the loft and by my bed, praying lustily all the way, and throwing himself from the other end of the loft into a manger. He darted, naked as he was, through among the furious horses, and making the door that stood open, in a moment he vanished and left me in the lurch. Powerless with terror, and calling out fearfully, I tried to follow his example, but not knowing the situation of the places with regard to one another, I missed the manger and fell on the pavement in one of the stalls. I was both stunned and lamed on the knee, but terror prevailing, I got up and tried to escape. It was out of my power, for there were divisions and cross-divisions in the house, and mad horses smashing everything before them so that I knew not so much as on what side of the house the door was. Two or three times was I knocked down by the animals, but all the while I never stinted, crying out with all my power. At length I was seized by the throat and hair of the head, and dragged away I wist not whither. My voice was now laid, and all my powers, both mental and bodily, totally overcome and I remember no more till I found myself lying naked on the kitchen table of the farmhouse, and something like a horse's rug thrown over me. The only hint that I got from the people of the house on coming to myself was that my absence would be good company, and that they had got me in a woeful state, one which they did not choose to describe or hear described. As soon as daylight appeared, I was packed about my business with the hisses and execrations of the yeoman's family, who viewed me as a being to be shunned, ascribing to me the visitations of that unholy night. Again was I on my way southwards, as lonely, hopeless, and degraded a being as was to be found on life's weary round. As I limped out the way, I wept, thinking of what I might have been, and what I had really become of my high and flourishing hopes when I set out as the avenger of God on the sinful children of men, of all that I had dared for the exaltation and progress of the truth. And it was with great difficulty that my faith remained unshaken. Yet was I preserved from that sin, and comforted myself with the certainty that the believer's progress through life is one of warfare and suffering. My case was indeed a pitiable one. I was lame, hungry, fatigued, and my resources on the very eve of being exhausted. Yet these were but secondary miseries, and hardly worthy of a thought compared with those I suffered inwardly. I not only looked around me with terror at every one that approached, but I was become a terror to myself, or rather my body and soul were become terrors to each other, and had it been possible I felt as if they would have gone to war. I dared not look at my face in a glass, for I shuddered at my own image and likeness. I dreaded the dawning and trembled at the approach of night, nor was there one thing in nature that afforded me the least delight. In this deplorable state of body and mind was I jogging on towards the Tweed, by the side of the small river called Ellen, when just at the narrowest part of the glen, whom should I meet full in the face, but the very being and all the universe of God would the most gladly have shunned. I had no power to fly from him, neither durst I, for the spirit within me, accuse him of falsehood and renounce his fellowship. I stood before him like a condemned criminal, 
staring him in the face, ready to be winded, twisted, and tormented as he pleased. He regarded me with a sad and solemn look. How changed was now that majestic countenance to one of haggard despair, changed in all save the extraordinary likeness to my late brother, a resemblance which misfortune and despair tended only to heighten. There were no kind greetings passed between us at meeting, like those which passed between the men of the world. He looked on me with eyes that froze the currents of my blood, but spoke not till I assumed as much courage as to articulate, "'You here, I hope you have brought me tidings of comfort?' "'Tidings of despair,' said he, "'but such tidings as the timid and the ungrateful deserve "'and have reason to expect. "'You are an outlaw and a vagabond in your country, "'and a high reward is offered for your apprehension. "'The enraged populace have burnt your house "'and all that is within it, "'and the farmers on the land bless themselves at being rid of you. "'So fare it with everyone who puts his hand "'to the great work of man's restoration to freedom "'and draweth back.' condemning the light that is within him. Your enormities cause me to leave you to yourself for a season, and you see what the issue has been. You have given some evil ones power over you, who long to devour you, both soul and body, and had has required all my power and influence to save you. Had it not been for my hand, you have been torn in pieces last night, but for once I prevailed." We must leave this land forthwith, for here there is neither peace, safety, nor comfort for us. Do you now and here pledge yourself to one who has so often saved your life and has put his own at stake to do so? Do you pledge yourself that you will henceforth be guided by my counsel and follow me whithersoever I choose to lead? I have always been swayed by your counsel, said I, and for your sake, principally, am I sorry that all our measures have proved abortive. But I hope still to be useful in my native isle. Therefore, let me plead that your highness will abandon a poor despised and outcast wretch to his fate, and betake you to your realms, where your presence cannot but be greatly wanted. Would that I could do so, said he woefully. But to talk of that is to talk of an impossibility. I am wedded to you so closely that I feel as if I were the same person. Our essences are one, our bodies and spirits being united, so that I am drawn towards you as by magnetism, and wherever you are, there must my presence be with you. Perceiving how this assurance affected me, he began to chide me most bitterly for my ingratitude, and then he assumed such looks that it was impossible for me longer to bear them. Therefore I staggered out of the way, begging and beseeching of him to give me up to my fate, and hardly knowing what I said, for it struck me that with all his assumed appearance of misery and wretchedness, there were traits of exultation in his hideous countenance, manifesting a secret and inward joy at my utter despair. It was long before I durst look over my shoulder, but when I did so, I perceived this ruined and debased potentate coming slowly on the same path, and I prayed that the Lord would hide me in the bowels of the earth or depths of the sea. When I crossed the Tweed, I perceived him still a little behind me, and my despair being then at its height, I cursed the time I first met with such a tormentor though on a little recollection it occurred that it was at that blessed time when I was solemnly dedicated to the Lord and assured of my final election and confirmation by an eternal decree never to be annulled. This being my sole and only comfort, I recalled my curse upon the time and repented me of my rashness. After crossing the Tweed, I saw no more of my persecutor that day, and had hopes that he had left me for a season. But alas, what hope was there of my relief after the declaration I had so lately heard? I took up my lodgings that night in a small, miserable inn in the village of Ancrum, of which the people seemed alike poor and ignorant. Before going to bed, I asked if it was customary with them to have family worship of evenings. 
The man answered that they were so hard set with the world that they often could not get time. But if I would be so kind as to officiate, they would be much obliged to me. I accepted the invitation, being afraid to go to rest, lest the commotions of the foregoing night might be renewed, and continued the worship as long as in decency I could. The poor people thanked me, hoped my prayers would be heard both on their account and my own, seemed much taken with my abilities, and wondered how a man of my powerful eloquence chanced to be wandering about in a condition so forlorn. I said I was a poor student of theology on my way to Oxford. They stared at one another with expressions of wonder, disappointment, and fear. I afterwards came to learn that the term theology was by then quite misunderstood, and that they had some crude conceptions that nothing was taught at Oxford but the black arts, which ridiculous idea prevailed over all the south of Scotland. For the present I could not understand what the people meant, and less so when the man asked me with deep concern if I was serious in my intentions of going to Oxford. He hoped not, and that I would be better guided. I said my education wanted finishing. But he remarked that the Oxford arts were a bad finish for a religious man's education. Finally, I requested him to sleep with me, or in my room, all the night, as I wanted some serious and religious conversation with him, and likewise to convince him that the study of the fine arts, though not absolutely necessary, were not incompatible with the character of a Christian divine. He shook his head and wondered how I could call them fine arts, hoped I did not mean to convince him by any ocular demonstration, and at length reluctantly consented to sleep with me and let the lass and wife sleep together for one night. I believe he would have declined it had it not been some hints from his wife, stating that it was a good arrangement, by which I understood there were only two beds in the house, and that when I was preferred to the lass's bed, she had one to shift for. The landlord and I accordingly retired to our homely bed, and conversed for some time about indifferent matters, till he fell sound asleep. Not so with me. I had that within which would not suffer me to close my eyes, and about the dead of night I heard again the same noises and contention begin outside the house as I had heard the night before, and again I heard it was about a sovereign and peculiar right in me. At one time the noise was on the top of the house, straight above our bed, as if the one party were breaking through the roof, and the other forcibly preventing it. At another it was at the door, and at a third time at the window, but still mine host lay sound by my side and did not waken. I was seized with terrors indefinable and prayed fervently, but did not attempt rousing my sleeping companion until I saw if no better could be done. The women, however, were alarmed, and rushing into our apartment exclaimed that all the devils in hell were besieging the house. Then, indeed, the landlord awoke, and it was time for him, for the tumult had increased to such a degree that it shook the house to its foundations, being louder and more furious than I could have conceived the heat of battle to be when the volleys of artillery are mixed with groans, shouts, and blasphemous cursing. It thundered and lightened, and there were screams, groans, laughter, and execrations, all intermingled. I lay trembling and bathed in a cold perspiration, but was soon obliged to bestir myself, the inmates attacking me one after the other. Oh, Tam Douglas, Tam Douglas, haste ye and rise out, fray out that incarnal devil, cried the wife. Ye are in iant the old ain in self. For our last Tibby saw his cloven clutes last night. Lord forbid, roared Tam Douglas and darted over the bed like a flying fish. Then hearing the unearthly tumult with which he was surrounded, he turned to the side of the bed and addressed me thus with long and fearful intervals. If ye be the deil, rise up and depart in peace out of this house. Afore the bedstry take kindling about ye, and then it'll maybe be the war for ye. Get up and gang away out among your cronies like a good lad. There's nobody here wishes you any ill. Do you hear me? 
Friend, said I, no Christian would turn out a fellow creature on such a night as this, and in the midst of such a commotion of the villagers. Nay, nah, if he be a mortal man, said he, which I rather think from the use you made of the holy book. Nay, nay, your practical jokes on strangers and honest folks. These are some of your Oxford tricks, and I'll thank ye to be o'er with them. Gracious heaven, they are brickin' through the house and the four corners at the same time. The last Tibby, seeing the innkeeper was not going to prevail with me to rise, flew towards the bed in desperation, and seizing me by the waist, soon landed me on the floor, saying, Be ye Dale, be ye child, ye's no lie there till bathe the house and us be swallowed up. Her master and mistress applauding the deed, I was obliged to attempt dressing myself, a task to which my powers were quite inadequate in the state I was in. But I was readily assisted by every one of the three, and as soon as they got my clothes thrust on in a loose way, they shut their eyes lest they should see what might drive them distracted, and thrust me out to the street, cursing me and calling on the fiends to take their prey and be gone. The scene that ensued is neither to be described nor believed if it were. I was momently surrounded by a number of hideous fiends who gnashed on me with their teeth and clenched their crimson paws in my face, and at the same instant I was seized by the collar of my coat behind by my dreaded and devoted friend, who pushed me on and with his gilded rapier waving and brandishing him round me, defending me against all their united attacks. Horrible as my assailants were in appearance, and they all had monstrous shapes, I felt that I would rather have fallen into their hands than be thus led away captive by my defender at his will and pleasure, without having the right or power to say my life, or any part of my will was my own. I could not even thank him for his potent guardianship, but hung down my head and moved on I knew not whither, like a criminal led to execution, and still the infernal combat continued till about the dawning, at which time I looked up, and all the fiends were expelled but one, who kept at a distance. And still my persecutor and defender pushed me by the neck before him. At length he desired me to sit down and take some rest, with which I complied, for I had great need of it, and wanted the power to withstand what he desired. There, for a whole morning, did he detain me, tormenting me with reflections on the past and pointing out the horrors of the future until a thousand times I wished myself non-existent. I have attached myself to your wayward fortune, said he, and it has been my ruin as well as thine. Ungrateful as you are, I cannot give you up to be devoured, but this is a life that is impossible to brook longer. Since our hopes are blasted in this world, and all our schemes of grandeur overthrown, and since our everlasting destiny is settled by a decree which no act of ours can invalidate, let us fall by our own hands, or by the hands of each other, die like heroes, and throwing off this frame of dross and corruption, mingle with the pure ethereal essence of existence from which we derived our being." I shuddered at a view of the dreadful alternative, yet was obliged to confess that in my present circumstances existence was not to be borne. It was in vain that I reasoned on the sinfulness of the deed and on its damning nature. He made me condemn myself out of my own mouth by allowing the absolute nature of justifying grace and the impossibility of the elect ever falling from the faith or the glorious end to which they were called. And then he said, this granted, self-destruction was the act of a hero, and none but a coward would shrink from it to suffer a hundred times more every day and night that passed over his head. I said I was still contented to be that coward, and all that I begged of him was to leave me to my fortune for a season, and to the just judgment of my creator, but he said his word and honour were engaged on my behalf, and these in such a case were not to be violated. If you will not pity yourself, have pity on me, added he. Turn your eyes on me, and behold to what I am reduced. Involuntarily did I return at the request, and caught a half-glance of his features. 
May no eye destined to reflect the beauties of the new Jerusalem inward upon the beatific soul, behold such a sight as mine then beheld. My immortal spirit, blood, and bones were all withered at the blasting sight, and I arose and withdrew with groanings which the pangs of death shall never wring from me. Not daring to look behind me, I crept on my way, and that night reached this hamlet on the Scottish border, and being grown reckless of danger and hardened to scenes of horror, I took up my lodging with a poor hind who was a widower and who could only accommodate me with a bed of rushes at his fireside. At midnight I heard some strange sounds, too much resembling those to which I had of late been inured, but they kept at a distance, and I was soon persuaded that there was a power protected that house, superior to those that contended for or had the mastery over me. Overjoyed at finding such an asylum, I remained in the humble cot. This is the third day I have lived under the roof, freed of my hellish assailants, spending my time in prayer and writing out this my journal, which I have fashioned to stick in with my printed work, and to which I intend to add portions while I remain in this pilgrimage state, which, I find too well, cannot be long. End of section 15section 16 of the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the private memoirs and confessions of a justified sinner by james hogg section 16 august 3rd 1712 this morning the hind has brought me word from redisdale whether he had been for coals that a stranger gentleman had been traversing that country making the most earnest inquiries after me or one of the same appearance and from the description that he brought of the stranger i could easily perceive who it was rejoicing that my tormentor has lost traces of me for once i am making haste to leave my asylum on pretense of following the stranger but in reality to conceal myself still more completely from his search perhaps this may be the last sentence ever i am destined to write if so farewell christian reader may god grant to thee a happier destiny than has been allotted to me here on earth and the same assurance of the acceptance above amen alt right august twenty fourth seventeen twelve here am i set down on the open moor to add one sentence more to my woeful journal and then farewell all beneath the sun on leaving the hind's cottage on the border i hasted to the northwest because in that quarter i perceived the highest and wildest hills before me as i crossed the mountains above hawick i exchanged clothes with the poor homely shepherd whom i found lying on a hillside singing to himself some woeful love ditty he was glad of the change and proud of his saintly apparel and i was no less delighted with mine by which I now suppose myself completely disguised. And I found moreover that in this garb of a common shepherd I was made welcome in every house. I slept the first night in a farmhouse, nigh to the church of Robertson, without hearing or seeing aught extraordinary. Yet I observed next morning that all of the servants kept aloof from me and regarded me with looks of aversion. The next night I came to this house where the farmer engaged me as a shepherd, and, finding him a kind, worthy, and religious man, I accepted of his terms with great gladness. I had not, however, gone many times to the sheep, before all the rest of the shepherds told my master that I knew nothing about herding, and begged of him to dismiss me. He perceived too well the truth of their intelligence, but, being much taken with my learning and religious conversation, he would not put me away, but set me to herd his cattle. It was lucky for me that before I came here a report had prevailed, perhaps for an age, that this farmhouse was haunted at certain seasons by a ghost. I say it was lucky for me, for I had not been in it many days before the same appalling noises began to prevail around me about midnight, often continuing till near the dawning. 
Still, they kept aloof and without doors, for this gentleman's house, like the cottage I was in formerly, seemed to be a sanctuary from all demoniacal power. He appears to be a good man and a just, and mocks at the idea of supernatural agency, and he either does not cure these persecuting spirits, or will not acknowledge it, though of late he appears much perturbed. The consternation of the menials has been extreme. They ascribed all to the ghost and tell frightful stories of murders having been committed there long ago. Of late, however, they are beginning to suspect that it is I that am haunted, and as I have never given them any satisfactory account of myself, they are whispering that I am a murderer and haunted by the spirits of those I have slain. August 30th. This day I have been informed that I am to be banished the dwelling, house by night, and to sleep in an outhouse by myself to try if the family can get any rest when freed of my presence. I have peremptorily refused equisance, on which my master's brother struck me and kicked me with his foot. My body being quite exhausted by suffering, I am grown weak and feeble, both in mind and bodily frame and actually unable to resent any insult or injury. I am the child of earthly misery and despair, if ever there was one existence. My master is still my friend, but there are so many masters here, and every one of them alike harsh to me, that I wish myself in my grave every hour of the day. If I am driven from the family sanctuary by night, I know I shall be torn in pieces before morning, and then who will deign or dare to gather up my mangled limbs and give me honored burial? My last hour is arrived. I see my tormentor once more approaching me in this wild. Oh, that the earth would swallow me up, or the hill fall and cover me. Farewell forever. September 7th, 1712. My devoted princely but sanguine friend has been with me again and again. My time has expired, and I find a relief beyond measure, for he has fully convinced me that no act of mine can mar the eternal counsel or in the smallest degree alter or extenuate one event which was decreed before the foundations of the world were laid. He said he had watched over me with the greatest anxiety, but perceiving my rooted aversion towards him, he had forborne troubling me with his presence. But now, seeing that I was certainly to be driven from my sanctuary that night, and that there would be a number of infernals watching to make a prey of my body, he came to caution me not to despair, for that he would protect me at all risks if the power remained with him. He then repeated an ejaculatory prayer, which I was to pronounce, if in great extremity. I objected to the words as equivocal and susceptible of being rendered in a meaning perfectly dreadful. But he reasoned against this, and all reasoning with him is to no purpose. He said he did not ask me to repeat the words unless greatly straightened in that I saw his strength and power giving way, and when perhaps nothing else could save me. The dreaded hour of night arrived, and as he said, I was expelled from the family residence and ordered to a byre or cowhouse that stood parallel with the dwelling house behind, where on a divot loft my humble bedstead stood, and the cattle grunted and puffed below me. How unlike the splendid halls of Dow Castle, and to what I am now reduced, let the reflecting reader judge. Lord, thou knowest all that I have done for thy cause on earth. Why then art thou laying thy hand so sore upon me? Why hast thou set me as a bud of thy malice? But thy must be done. Thou wilt repay me in a better world. Amen. September 8th. My first night of trial in this place is overpast. With that it were the last that I should ever see in this detested world. If the horrors of hell are equal to those I have suffered, eternity will be of short duration there, for no created energy can support them for one single month or week. I have been buffeted as never living creature was. My vitals have been all torn, and every faculty and feeling of my soul racked and tormented into callous insensibility. I was even hung by the locks over a yawning chasm, to which I could perceive no bottom, and then not till then did I repeat the tremendous prayer. I was instantly at liberty, and what I now am, the Almighty knows. Amen. September 18, 1712. Still am I living, 
though liker to a vision than a human being. But this is my last day of mortal existence. Unable to resist any longer, I pledge myself to my devoted friend that on this day we should die together and trust to the charity of the children of men for a grave. I am solemnly pledged, and though I dare to repent, I am aware he will not be gainsaid, for he is raging with despair at his fallen and decayed majesty. And there is some miserable comfort in the idea that my tormentor shall fall with me. Farewell, world, with all thy miseries, for comfort or enjoyment hast thou none. Farewell, woman, whom I have despised and shunned, and man, who I have hated, whom nevertheless I desire to leave in charity. And thou, son, bright emblem of a far brighter effulgence, I bid farewell to thee also. I do not now take my last look of thee, for to thy glorious orb shall a poor suicide's last earthly look be raised. But ah, who is yon that I see approaching furiously, his stern face blackened with horrid despair? My hour is at hand, Almighty God. What is this that I am about to do? The hour of repentance is past, and now my fate is inevitable. Amen forever. I will now seal up my little book and conceal it, and cursed be he who tries to alter or amend. End of the memoir. End of section 16. Section 17 of The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg. Section 17. What can this work be? Sure, you will say, it must be an allegory, or, as the writer calls it, a religious parable, showing the dreadful danger of self-righteousness. I cannot tell. Attend to the sequel which is a thing so extraordinary, so unprecedented, and so far out of the common course of human events, that, if there were not hundreds of living witnesses to attest the truth of it, I would not bid any rational being believe it. In the first place, take the following extract from an authentic letter, published in Blackwood's magazine for August 1823. On the top of a wild height called Cowan's Croft, where the lands of three proprietors meet all at one point, there has been for long and many years the grave of a suicide, marked out by a stone, standing at the head and another at the feet. Often I have stood musing over it myself, when a shepherd on one of the farms, of which it formed the extreme boundary, and thinking what could induce a young man, who had scarcely reached the prime of his life, to brave his maker, and rush into his presence by an act of his own erring hand, and one so unnatural and preposterous but it never once occurred to me, as an object of curiosity, to dig up the mouldering bones of the culprit, which I considered as the most revolting of all objects. The thing was, however, done last month, and the discovery made of one of the greatest natural phenomena that I have heard of in this country. The little traditionary history that remains of this unfortunate youth is altogether a singular one. He was not a native of the place, nor would he ever tell from what place he came, but he was remarkable for a deep, thoughtful, and sullen disposition. There was nothing against his character that anybody knew of here, and he had been a considerable time in the place. The last service he was in was with a Mr. Anderson of Altreve, who died about a hundred years ago, and who had hired him during the summer to herd a stock of young cattle in Altreve Hope. It happened one day, in the month of September, that James Anderson, his master's son, went with this young man to the Hope to divert himself. The herd had his dinner along with him, and, about one o'clock, when the boy proposed going home, the former pressed him very hard to stay, and take share of his dinner, but the boy refused for fear his parents might be alarmed about him, and said he would go home, on which the herd said to him, Then, if you want to stay with me, James, you may depend on it. I'll cut my throat afore you come back here again. I have heard it likewise reported, but only by one person, that there had been some things stolen out of his master's house a good while before, and that the boy had discovered a silver knife and fork that was a part of the stolen property in the herd's possession that day, and that it was this discovery that drove him to despair. The boy did not return to the hope that afternoon, and, before evening, 
a man coming in at the pass called the Hart Loop with a drove of lambs on the way for Edinburgh, perceived something like a man standing in a strange, frightful position at the side of one of Eldon Hope Hayricks. The driver's attention was riveted on the strange, uncouth figure, and, as the drove rode passed at no great distance from the spot, he first called, but, receiving no answer, he went up to the spot, and, behold, it was the above-mentioned young man who had hung himself in the hay rope that was tying down the rick. This was accounted a great wonder, and everyone said, if the devil had not assisted him, it was impossible the thing could have been done, for, in general, these ropes are so brittle, being made of green hay, that they will scarcely bear to be bound over the rick. And, the more to horrify the good people of this neighbourhood, the driver said, when he first came in view, he could almost give his oath that he saw two people busily engaged at the hayrick, going round it and round it, and he thought they were dressing it. If this asseveration approximated at all to truth, it makes this evident at least, that the unfortunate young man had hanged himself after the man with the lambs came in view. He was, however, quite dead when they cut him down. He had fastened two of the old hay ropes at the bottom of the rick on one side, indeed they all fastened so when first laid on, so that he had nothing to do but to loosen two of the ends on the other side. These he had tied in a knot around his neck, and, slackening his knees, and letting himself down gradually, till the hay rope bore all his weight, he had contrived to put an end to his existence in that way. Now, the fact is, that if you try all the ropes that are thrown over all the outfield hay ricks in Scotland, there is not one among a thousand of them that will hang a collie dog. So that the manner of this wretch's death was rather a singular circumstance. Early next morning, Mr. Anderson's servants went reluctantly away, and, taking an old blanket with them for a winding sheet, they rolled up the body of the deceased, first in his own plaid, letting the hay rope still remain about his neck, and then, rolling the old blanket over all, they bore the loathed remains away to the distance of three miles or so, on spokes, to the top of Cowan's Croft, at the very point where the Duke of Buckley's land, the Laird of Drummel's ears, and Lord Napier's meet, and there they buried him, with all that he had on and about him, silver knife and fork and all together. Thus far went tradition, and no one ever disputed one jot of the disgusting oral tale. A nephew of that Mr. Anderson's, who was with the hapless youth that day he died, says that, as far as he can gather from the relations of friends that he remembers, and of that same uncle in particular, it is one hundred and five years next month, that is, September 1823, since that event happened. And, I think it likely that this gentleman's information is correct. But sundry other people, much older than he, whom I have consulted, pretend that it is six or seven years more. They say they have heard that Mr. James Anderson was then a boy ten years of age, that he lived to an old age, upwards of fourscore, and it is two and forty years since he died. Whichever way it may be, it was about that period some way. Of that there is no doubt. It so happened that two young men, William Sheel and W. Sword, were out on an adjoining height this summer, casting peats, and it came into their heads to open this grave in the wilderness and see if there were any of the bones of the suicide of former ages and centuries remaining. They did so, but opened only one half of the grave, beginning at the head and about the middle at the same time. It was not long till they came upon the old blanket, I think, they said, not much more than a foot from the surface. They tore that open, and there was the hay rope, lying stretched down alongst his breast, so fresh that they saw at first sight that it was made of risp, a sort of long sword grass that grows about marshes and the sides of lakes. One of the young men seized the rope and pulled by it, but the old enchantment of the devil remained, it would not break. And so he pulled and pulled at it, till behold, the body came up into a sitting posture, with a broad blue bonnet on its head and its plaid around it, all as fresh as the day it was laid in. I never heard of a preservation so wonderful, if it be true, as was related to me, for still I have not had the curiosity to go and view the body myself. The features were all so plain that an acquaintance might easily have known him. One of the lads gripped the face of the corpse with his finger and thumb, and the cheeks felt quite soft and fleshy, but the dimples remained, and did not spring out again. He had fine yellow hair, about nine inches long, but not a hair of it could they pull out till they cut part of it off with a knife. They also cut off some portions of his clothes, which were all quite fresh, and distributed them among their acquaintances, sending a portion to me, among the rest, to keep as natural curiosities. 
Several gentlemen have, in a manner, forced me to give them fragments of these enchanted garments. I have, however, retained a small portion for you, which I send along with this, being a piece of his plaid, and another of his waistcoat breast, which you will see are still as fresh as that day they were laid in the grave. His broad blue bonnet was sent to Edinburgh several weeks ago, to the great regret of some gentlemen connected with the land, who wished to have it for a keepsake. For my part, fond as I am of blue bonnets, and broad ones in particular, I declare I durst not have worn that one. There was nothing of the silver knife and fork discovered that I heard of, nor was it very likely it should, but it would appear he had been very near and out of cash, which I dare say had been the cause of his utter despair, for, on searching his pockets, nothing was found but three old Scotch halfpennies. These young men meeting with another shepherd afterwards, his curiosity was so much excited that they went and digged up the curious remains a second time, which was a pity, as it is likely that by these exposures to the air, and the impossibility of burying it up again as closely as it was before, the flesh will now fall to dust. The letter from which the above is an extract is signed James Hogg, and dated from Altreve Lake, August 1st, 1823. It bears the stamp of authenticity in every line, yet so often had I been hoaxed by the ingenious fancies displayed in that magazine, that when this relation met my eye, I did not believe it, but, from the moment that I perused it, I half formed the resolution of investigating these wonderful remains personally, if such existed, for, in the immediate vicinity of the scene, as I supposed, I knew of more attractive metal than the dilapidated remains of mouldering suicides. Accordingly, having some business in Edinburgh in September last, and being obliged to wait a few days for the arrival of a friend from London, I took that opportunity to pay a visit to my townsman and fellow collegian, Mr. L. of C., advocate. I mentioned to him Hogg's letter, asking him if the statement was founded at all on truth. His answer was, I suppose so. For my part, I never doubted the thing, having been told that there has been a great deal of talking about it up in the forest for some time past. But God knows, Hogg has imposed some ingenious lies on the public ere now. I said, if it was within reach, I should like exceedingly to visit both the shepherd and the Scotch mummy he had described. Mr. L. assented on the first proposal, saying he had no objections to take a ride that length with me, and make the fellow produce his credentials. That we would have a delightful jaunt through a romantic and now classical country, and some good sport into the bargain, provided he could procure a horse for me, from his father-in-law next day. He sent up to a Mr. L. to inquire, who returned for answer that there was an excellent pony at my service, and that he himself would accompany us being obliged to attend a great sheep fair at Thurliston, and that he was certain the shepherd would be there likewise. Mr. L. said that it was the very man we wanted to make our party complete, and, at an hour early next morning, we started for the U fair of Thurliston, taking Blackwood's magazine for August along with us. We rode through the ancient royal burr of Selkirk, halted and corned our horses at a romantic village, nigh to some deep linds on the Ettrick, and reached the market ground at Thurliston Green a little before midday. We soon found Hogg, standing near the foot of the market, as he called it, beside a great dove of Paulies, a species of stock that I had never heard of before. They were small sheep, striped on the backs with red chalk. Mr. L. introduced me to him as a great wool stapler, come to raise the price of that article, but he eyed me with distrust, and, turning his back on us, answered, I has selled mine. I followed, and, shewing him the above-quoted letter, said I was exceedingly curious to have a look at these singular remains he had so ingeniously described, but he had only answered me with the remark that it was a queer fancy for a wool stapler to talk. His two friends then requested him to accompany us to the spot, and to take some of his shepherds with us to assist in raising the body, but he spurned at the idea, saying, "'Od bless ye, lad! I hate ye the matters to mind. I hae either poorlies to sell, and a yon highland stots down the green, every inn, and then I had ten scores o' ewes to buy after. And, if I canna first sell my ain stock, I canna buy nae other bodies. I hear mair ado than I can manage the day, for by gangin' to hook up a hundred year old bairns. Finding that we could make nothing of him, we left him with his poorlies, highland stops, grey jacket, and broad blue bonnet, to go in search of some other guide. L soon found one, for he seemed acquainted with every person in the fair. We got a fine old shepherd, named W.B., a great original, and a very obliging and civil man, who asked no conditions, but that we should not speak of it, because he did not wish it to come to his master's ears that he had been engaged in such a profane thing. 
we promised strict secrecy, and accompanied by another farmer, Mr. S., and old B., we proceeded to the grave, which B. described as about a mile and a half distant from the market ground. We went into the shepherd's cot to get a drink of milk, when I read to our guide Mr. Hogg's description, asking him if he thought it correct. He said there was hardly a bit of it correct, for the grave was not on the hill of Cowanscroft, nor yet on the point where three lairds' lands met, but on the top of a hill called the Forelaw, where there was no land that was not the Duke of Buckloyce within a quarter of a mile. He added that it was a wonder how the poet could be mistaken there, who once herded the very ground where the grave is, and saw both hills from his own window. Mr. L. testified great surprise at such a singular blunder, as also how the body came not to be buried at the meeting of three or four laird's lands, which had always been customary in the south of Scotland. Our guide said he had always heard it reported that the old Treve men, with Mr. David Anderson at their head, had risen before day on the Monday morning, it having been on the Sabbath day that the man put down himself, and they set out with the intention of burying him on Cowan's Croft, where three marches met at a point. But, it having been an invariable rule to bury such lost sinners before the rising of the sun, these five men were overtaken by daylight, as they passed the house of Berry Knoll, and, by the time they reached the top of the forelaw, the sun was beginning to scare the east. On this, they laid down the body, and digged a deep grave with all expedition, but, when they had done, it was too short, and, the body being stiff, it would not go down, on which Mr. David Anderson, looking to the east and perceiving that the sun would be upon them in a few minutes, set his foot on the suicide's brow, and tramped down his head into the grave with his iron-heeled shoe, until the nose and skull crashed again, and, at the same time, uttered a terrible curse on the wretch who had disgraced the family and given them all this trouble. This anecdote, our guide said, he had heard when a boy, from the mouth of Robert Laidlaw, one of the five men who buried the body. We soon reached the spot, and, I confess, I felt a singular sensation when I saw the grey stone standing at the head, and another at the feet, and the one half of the grave manifestly new digged, and closed up again, as had been described. I could still scarcely deem the thing to be a reality, for the ground did not appear to be wet, but a kind of dry, rotten moss. On looking around, we found some fragments of clothes, some teeth, and a part of a pocket book, which had not been returned into the grave when the body had been last raised, for it had been raised twice before this but only from the loins upward. To work we fell with two spades, and soon cleared away the whole of the covering. The part of the grave that had been opened before was filled with mossy mortar, which impeded us exceedingly, and entirely prevented a proper investigation of the four parts of the body. I will describe everything as I saw it before our respectable witnesses, whose names I shall publish at large if permitted. A number of the bones came up separately, for, with the constant flow of liquid stuff into the deep grave, we could not see to preserve them in their places. At length, great loads of coarse clothes, blanketing, pladding, etc. appeared. We tried to lift these regularly up, and, on doing so, part of a skeleton came up, but no flesh, save a little that was hanging in dark flitters about the spine, but which had no consistence. It was merely the appearance of flesh, without the substance. The head was wanting, and, I being very anxious to possess the skull, the search was renewed among the mortar and rags. We first found part of the scalp, with the long hair firm on it, which, on being cleaned, is neither black nor fair, but a darkish dusk, the most common of any other colour. Soon afterwards we found the skull, but it was not complete. A spade had damaged it, and one of the temple quarters was wanting. I am no phrenologist, not knowing one organ from another, but I thought the skull of that wretched man no study. If it was particular for anything, it was for a smooth, almost perfect rotundity, with only a little protuberance above the vent of the ear. When we came to that part of the grave that had never been opened before, the appearance of everything was quite different. There the remains lay under a close vault of moss, and within a vacant space, and I suppose, by the digging in the former part of the grave, the part had been deepened, and drawn the moisture away from this part, for here all was perfect. The breeches still suited the thigh, the stocking the leg, and the garters were wrapped as neatly and as firm below the knee as if they had been newly tied. The shoes were all open in the seams, the hemp having decayed, but the soles, upper leathers, and wooden heels, which were made of birch, were all as fresh as any of those we wore. There was one thing I could not help remarking, that, in the inside of one of the shoes there was a layer of cow's dung, about one-eighth of an inch thick, and in the hollow of the sole fully one-fourth of an inch. 
It was firm, green, and fresh, and proved that he had been working in a buyer. His clothes were all of a singular ancient cut, and no less singular in their texture. Their durability certainly would have been prodigious, for in thickness, coarseness, and strength I never saw any cloth in the smallest degree equal to them. His coat was a frock coat, of a yellowish drab colour, with wide sleeves. It is tweeled, milled, and thicker than a carpet. I cut off two of the skirts and brought them with me. His vest was of striped serge, such as I have often seen worn by country people. It was lined and backed with white stuff. The breeches were a sort of striped plaiding, which I never saw worn, but which our guide assured us was very common in the country once, though, from the old clothes which we had seen remaining of it, he judged that it could not be less than two hundred years since it was in fashion. His garters were of worsted, and striped with black or blue, his stockings grey, and wanting the feet. I bought samples of all along with me. I have likewise now got possession of the bonnet, which puzzles me most of all. It is not comfortable with the rest of the dress. It is neither a broad bonnet nor a border bonnet, for there is an open behind for tying, which no genuine border bonnet I am told ever had. It seems to have been a highland bonnet, worn in a flat way, like a scone on the crown, such as is sometimes still seen in the west of Scotland. All the limbs, from the loins to the toes, seemed perfect and entire, but they could not bear handling. Before we got them returned again into the grave, they were shaken to pieces, except the thighs, which continued to retain a kind of flabby form. All his clothes that were sewed with linen yarn were lying in separate portions, the thread having rotten, but such as were sewed with worsted remained perfectly firm and sound. Among such a confusion, we had hard work to find out all his pockets, and our guide supposed that, after all, we did not find above the half of them. In his vest pocket was a long clasp knife, very sharp. The haft was thin, and the scales shone as if there had been silver inside. Mr. S took it with him, and presented it to his neighbour, Mr. R. of W. L., who still has it in his possession. We found a comb, a gimblet, a vial, a small neat square board, a pair of plated knee buckles, and several samples of cloth of different kinds, rolled neatly up within one another. At length, while we were busy on the search, Mr. L. picked up a leathern case, which seemed to have been wrapped round and round by some ribbon, or cord, that had been rotten from it, for the swaddling mark still remained. Both L. and B. called out that it was a tobacco spliken, and a well-filled in too. But, on opening it out, we found, to our great astonishment, that it contained a printed pamphlet. We were all curious to see what sort of a pamphlet such a person would read, what it would contain that he seemed to have had such a care about, for the slough in which it was rolled had a fine chamois leather. What colour it had been could not be known, but the pamphlet was wrapped so close together, and so damp, rotten, and yellow, that it seemed one solid piece. We all concluded from some words that we could make out that it was a religious tract, but that it would be impossible to make anything of it. Mr. L. remarked that it was a great pity if a few sentences could not be made out, for that it was a question what might be contained in that little book, and then he requested Mr. L. to give it to me, as he had so many things of literature and law to attend to that he would never think more of it. He replied that either of us were heartily welcome to it, for that he had thought of returning it into the grave, if he could have made out but a line or two, to have seen what was its tendency. "'Grave man!' exclaimed L., who speaks excellent strong broad Scotch. "'My truly, but ye grave weel. I would estimate the contents of that spoiken as the most precious treasure. I'll tell you what it is, sir. I hae often wondered how it was that this man's corpse had been miraculously preserved for decay, a hundred times langer than any other body's, or than ever a tanner's. But now I could wager a guinea it has been for the preservation of that little book, and Lord kens what may be in it. It will maybe reveal some mystery that mankind disna ken nothing about yet. If there be any mysteries in it, returned the other, it is not for your handling, my dear friend, who are too much taken up about mysteries already. And, with these words, he presented the mysterious pamphlet to me. With very little trouble, save that of a thorough drying, I unrolled it with all ease, and found the very tract which I have here ventured to lay before the public, part of it in small bad print, and the remainder in manuscript. The title page is written and is as follows. The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner Written by himself, Fidele Certa Mercies And, alongst the head, it is the same as given in the present edition of the work. I altered the title to A Self-Justified Sinner, 
but my booksellers did not approve of it, and, there being a curse pronounced by the writer on him that should dare to alter or amend, I have let it stand as it is. Should it be thought to attach discredit to any received principle of our church, I am blameless. The printed part ends at page 201, and the rest is in a fine old hand, extremely small and close. I have ordered the printer to procure a facsimile of it, to be bound in with the volume. V. Frontispiece. With regard to the work itself, I dare not venture a judgment, for I do not understand it. I believe no person, man or woman, will ever peruse it with the same attention that I have done, and yet I confess that I do not comprehend the writer's drift. It is certainly impossible that these scenes could ever have occurred that he describes as having himself transacted. I think it may be possible that he had some hand in the death of his brother, and yet I am disposed greatly to doubt it, and the numerous traditions, etc., which remain of that event, may be attributable to the work having been printed and burnt, and, of course, the story known to all the printers with their families and gossips. That the young laird of Delcastle came by a violent death there remains no doubt, but that this wretch slew him, there is to me a good deal. However, allowing this to have been the case, I account all the rest either dreaming or madness, or, as he says to Mr. Watson, a religious parable, on purpose to illustrate something scarcely tangible, but to which he seems to have attached a great deal of weight. Were the relation at all consistent with reason, it corresponds so minutely with traditionary facts that it could scarcely have missed to have been received as authentic, but in this day, and with the present generation, it will not go down that a man should be daily tempted by the devil in the semblance of a fellow-creature, and at length lured to self-destruction, in the hope that this same fiend and tormentor was to suffer and fall along with him. It was a bold theme for an allegory, and would have suited that age well had it been taken up by one fully qualified for the task, which this writer was not. In short, we must either conceive him not only the greatest fool, but the greatest wretch, on whom was ever stamped the form of humanity. That he was a religious maniac, who wrote and wrote about a deluded creature, till he arrived at that height of madness which he believed himself the very object whom he had been all along describing, and, in order to escape from an ideal tormentor, committed that act for which, according to the tenets he embraced, there was no remission, and which consigned his memory and his name to everlasting detestation. End of section 17 End of The Private Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner by James Hogg